All right, thank you. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone, depending on where you are, uh, and happy Friday. Uh, and welcome to today's webinar on using accessible technology in the workplace. My name is Lauren McCola, and I'm pleased to serve as today's session chair. I'm also the project director of the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, or PEAT, which is the sponsor of today's event. I know many of you have joined us for our previous webinars, and this is a continuation of that series. We're glad you're joining us, and you can expect more to come from Pete going forward. We have an absolutely outstanding panel of experts here today, and we look forward to introducing them in just a minute. But let me just start with a couple of housekeeping items and accessibility information. Most of you are joining us through the Adobe Connect platform and are hearing the audio by voice over IP through your computers. The audio is also available over a phone line for those of you who would like to listen to today's event in that way. And the conference call-in number is 1-866-365. Again, the number is 1-866-365-3921. And the conference code that you need to enter uh, after you dial is 7247-88. 6139. We're also uh, live captioning this webinar, uh, which you can follow along uh, by clicking the link. Additionally, you can find the captioning link in the reminder of the email that you received yesterday. Please note that we will also be accepting questions from the audience during today's discussion, and you can submit your questions by typing them into the Q&A window on your screen. So with all of that out of the way, let's get into the subject at hand. I thought I'd tee it up, the, the discussion, by briefly connecting the dots between accessibility and employment and by telling you about the project that I lead. Accessible technology is obviously crucial to the hiring, employment, and career advancement of people with disabilities because when someone, anyone, can't access or operate the tools that they need to do their jobs, they can't perform to their fullest potential. And all of us have a role to play in solving this workplace accessibility puzzle. Employers need to buy and implement workplace technologies that are accessible. Technology providers need to manufacture accessible technology for the marketplace. And people with disabilities really need to know what tools they need to be productive on the job, how to operate them effectively, and how to request the support that they need from their employers. So it's that very trio of stakeholders that we're really aiming to serve with the PEAT project, which is a multifaceted initiative working to advance the employment, retention, and career advancement of people with disabilities through the development, adoption, and promotion of accessible technology. PEAT is actually funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy through a cooperative grant agreement with RESNA, and it's the only entity of its kind that brings together employers, technology developers, accessibility thought leaders, disability advocates, government policymakers, and consumers around this topic. Next month, we're going to be launching PeteWorks.org, which is an online resource center that will house <clears throat> Pete's education and outreach activities. It's basically an online portal that will feature educational articles, guest blog posts, a basic primer on accessible workplace technology, and a gateway to opportunities to collaborate and contribute to the dialogue around accessible technology in the workplace. <clears throat> also featured is a, tech, a tool called TechCheck, which is an interactive tool to help employers assess their technology accessibility practices, and find tools to help develop them further. You can visit www.peatworks.org now to sign up for email updates um, about the portal's launch and to learn more about getting involved. And you can also follow PeteWorks on Facebook and Twitter. Now in preparation for today's discussion, I'd like to talk briefly about the difference between assistive and accessible technology. Many people use the two terms interchangeably, and although they are related, they're not the same. 
Accessible technology is technology that can be used successfully by people with a wide range of abilities and disabilities. Assistive technology, or AT, is a piece of equipment or system used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. Examples of AT include alternative input devices that enable control of computers through means other than a standard keyboard or mouse, such as voice recognition software, head-operated pointing devices, and sip and puff systems controlled by breathing, and screen readers, which allow users like me, who are blind, to hear what is happening on their computers by converting the screen display to digitized speech. While Pete strongly supports product compatibility with AT, our primary focus is encouraging employers and technology providers to buy and or develop products that are directly accessible, whereby they are usable by the widest range of people possible, right out of the box. And since Pete is so focused on accessibility, I want to say a little bit about how we think about it. For us, accessibility is all about the user interface. It gives the user a convenient, effective, and equitable way to control the technology and put it to good use. Accessibility often falls into the same category as usability in that both seek to improve user experience and effectiveness of the product. Usability covers the user experience at a macro level, while accessibility addresses the specific needs of users with disabilities. However, in terms of actual product features, they can overlap. For example, a feature like volume control benefits everyone, as does the ability to zoom and display on a small mobile device. <clears throat> and really, this overall is often referred to as universal design, which means products are designed to be used by the widest range of people possible. So I really hope that that provides some basic background and a framework for our discussion today. Now, without further ado, let's get to it. I'm going to hand it over to our distinguished moderator, Richard Crispin, to introduce himself, and then we'll hear from each of our panelists. Richard, take it away. Thanks so much, Lauren, for that great introduction. That really, I think, really gave a great framing to our discussion for today. And I know that we have a lot to get to, so I really want to just dive in here. As Lauren said, I am Richard Crispin, and I am the CEO of Collaborate Up. We specialize in accelerating collaboration on important issues like this one, and I'm truly honored to serve as your moderator for today. As moderator, I'll be playing traffic pop. Top. That means that I'll be making sure that our panelists get to share their great information with you. But more than that, I'm here to make sure that you get your questions answered and your issues addressed. This is your webinar. I really want to encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to submit questions, um, as Lauren indicated, uh, so that we can get to as many of those as possible uh, and make that, uh, uh, that work for everybody. Um, that end, I, what I also want to do is, actually, I want to get your voice into this discussion right now from the very beginning. Uh, and what I want to do is uh, pose a polling question to you there in the audience. So if we could bring up our first polling question, please. Uh, perfect. So uh, what we want to know is, what is your role in your organization? Are you, uh, where do you fall along these different um, uh, roles here. Are you an entrepreneur, a sole proprietor, an exec in executive management, or do you work in finance and accounting, in sales and business development, in administration? Are you a developer or a programmer? Are you an accessibility specialist? Are you a marketing and communications uh, or in human resources, government affairs, uh, or other? And then please, um, please uh, respond to that poll. And we'll discuss the results here in just a minute. But while we're waiting uh, for you in the audience to, to complete our poll, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Our, our first panelist is Zuhair Mahmoud, who is an information technology specialist at the Library of Congress. Uh, please join me in Zuhair. Uh, Zuhair, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Hello, good morning, or good afternoon, or whatever, wherever you, you may be. Um, I am uh, Zuhair Mahmoud, and I work uh, at the Library of Congress. I am totally blind, and um, I uh, was born totally blind, and so I'm a screen reader user. 
and also use other assistive technologies um, on mobile phones. My role in my organization, I play a dual role. I uh, work in technology assessment, and that's not limited to adaptive technology or, or, or assistive technology, although assistive technology is a part of it. Uh, but what we do is we evaluate new technologies and uh, explore their use and how they could make our lives easier, both at the library internally and also to provide services to the American public. Um, the other role I play is I manage the Adaptive Technology Demonstration Center, which is our information technology accessibility hub at the, hub at the Library of Congress. So we provide, uh, again, we, we evaluate equipment for for uh, potential, but we also provide uh, 508 compliance services to uh, various library departments that have on IT projects. So that's that's kind of a, a quick brief introduction. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Zuhair. Uh, next, I'd like to. Um, bring uh, Lee Greco into our conversation here. Lucy is a web accessibility evangelist at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, good afternoon to you, Lucy, or perhaps good morning there in, in California. What should our audience know about you? Hello. Um, yes, I, I work at UC Berkeley, but also I advise the Calif University of California system-wide in ways to become more accessible with web technologies primarily, but also with technology acquisition and technology development on all of our campuses at the UC system. Um, my role is, first of all, to evaluate products for their accessibility, but also to train and work with developers to teach them how to become more accessible in their work and incorporate the culture of accessibility, hence the evangelist in my title, is that I teach people to not only know and understand accessibility, but to believe in it and incorporate it in their daily work. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Lucy. Um, and if I could ask our panelists, if you're not speaking, to please uh, mute your line. We are getting a little bit of feedback uh, on the line. Uh, last but certainly not least, I want to bring in uh, Ken Herrenstein, who is a software engineer at Google. Welcome, Ken, and please uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself as well. Hello there. Hi, everybody. Uh, like, you, like Richard said, my name is Ken Stein. Um, my voice might sound a little bit different than last time you <coughs> met with me, if you met with me before, because I'm speaking through a sign language interpreter. I'm deaf. Um, and like Richard said, I'm a software engineer at Google. And I have two big hats here. One, because I'm deaf myself, I'm an advocate for accessibility in the company. And secondly, I'm actually also the implementer of accessible technology here at Google. Most people know me for the implementation of closed captioning on YouTube, and that's it. <laughs> Wonderful, Ken. That's uh, that's terrific. Thank you so much. Um, the other thing I just want to cover again is I want to ask everybody to please uh, do submit questions. Uh, we'll we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. You can do that by uh, via Twitter um, by submitting them using the hashtag PeteWorks. That's P-E-A-T-W-O-R-K-S at Twitter. You can submit them right here using the uh, the Adobe uh, platform, um, and you can also email them to us uh, if you would like as well. So please do send in those questions, and I will, as I said, try to get to as many of them as I can. Um, today's session is going to be a real dialogue among our esteemed panelists here, and we have dispensed with them doing formal presentations so we can get right into the conversation. And Lauren, I hope that you'll join us in that dialogue as well. Uh, before we get into that discussion, I, I want to again hear from you there in the audience. So if we could bring up our second uh, polling question, please. Uh, and the question that we want to ask you is, do you have an accessible technology initiative in your organization? Um, oh, you know what, I forgot to, you know, I actually forgot to um, to look at the, at the polling results from the last poll. So could we, uh, before we show this next poll, could we see the results from this poll, please? Uh, 
hopefully those will come up here for us in just a second. Uh, but it looks like what we're looking at here, ah, I see. So uh, we've got about 24 uh, percent uh, on the line who are accessibility specialists. Uh, that makes up our biggest chunk there. Uh, the next one happens to come from uh, from other uh, and then human resources. Uh, so we've got a print, but then we've got still um, representatives from executive management, from administration, uh, and, and a few other places there. So that um, we've got a really nice um, group of folks here on the on the line. Um, and if we could go ahead and also bring up our our second polling there qu polling question there about whether or not you have a accessible technology initiative in your organization. You could yes, no, or I don't know. Um, while we're waiting for our viewers to respond to that poll, let's have a discussion with our panelists. I think everyone listening in knows just how critical accessibility is for the employment of people with disabilities. Uh, our panelists, uh, you guys are the experts, and you talk about this all the time. So the first thing I want to know from you is what do you people, especially companies, and employers about why it's so important that they make accessibility a priority for both procuring and developing technology products. Uh, and uh, perhaps, uh, Lucy, if I can turn to you first, please. Definitely. So what I try to explain to people is I, I avoid the, the frequently um, sorry, the, the frequently misdone action of saying it's the law, you must do it, because that's that's always a turn off to people. So I tend to show people by demonstrating, I am a screen reader user myself, I'm totally blind, how an inaccessible product is a barrier and how difficult it is for an individual to use a product that is inaccessible. And then show them how quickly and how accomplished a person who is using accessible technology can work. So I tend to lead through demonstration, lead through guidance, I get people on my side by showing them how hard it can be. So if I have an inaccessible application, I turn to people and say to them, look at this application, look how hard it is. Inevitably, I find that they say, well, actually, that's something that's very difficult for me, too. I do it this way. Can you do it this way? And I say, well, no, but if it was better for both of us we would all be able to access it, and then the employability for all of us is so much better. That's terrific. So it's not just a question of compliance. Uh, it, really what you're trying to do is create a, um, an empathy based on personal experience, so that you, sh you show them how productivity is trapped, uh, really, in a, in a good portion of the population here uh, if, if they, they don't have access to the, these kinds of technologies. Uh, and that, in fact, if, if we use principles, as, as Lauren said, like universal design and others, we can make things better for everybody and really create more productivity in the workplace. It, it, exactly. And it's all, it, it turns out to be that inevitably the problems I have, if they're not identical to what an able-bodied individual has, reflect the problems they have too. So it, it definitely, you know, I definitely focus on the universal access and the universal usability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Zahir, uh, there at the Library of Congress, um, what, what do you tell, uh, tell your, your colleagues? Well, first of all, um, I, I would emphasize the uh, points that you both, uh, you and Lucy, have just um, mentioned. I would also always add the business for accessibility because at a time of scarce resources, you know, people are conscious of cost. And the biggest um, problem I have or the, the biggest um, myth I hear is that people are saying, well, we don't have that many people with disabilities, so why should we spend much cost at making our systems accessible and compliant um, when we're really not catering to that many people? So the first thing that we usually um, respond with or, or inform people with is that you're not catering to the people you already have. When you're designing an accessible system, you're designing it for everyone. Um, that would include the public, your stakeholders, potential employees. So you don't want to limit potential employees by having inaccessible systems. And that goes straight to the business case because it is cheaper. It is a lot less expensive to design a system as an accessible system from the start rather than go back and retrofit it, right, which is what, what the trend is now. You go somewhere and you find that a system is inaccessible 
and then you know somebody has to take care of the problem. And according to uh, Pressman, who, who wrote a, a pretty respectable book on pro project management, if you start developing a product without putting accessibility in your requirements, and then find yourself having to go back uh, and and reapply accessibility or retrofit for accessibility, it's going to estimate it's estimated to cost you six times as much. If you wait till release, it may actually cost you as much as. 60 times uh, the original cost in, in some instances to make your product accessible. So why not do it from the start? Put it as part of your development cycle or procurement cycle. That way it's a done deal. You never have to worry about it. Wonderful. So there's really a solid business case for, for building it in from the beginning um, in, in terms of cost avoidance and even, even real, real hard cost savings down the line. Absolutely. Um, I just want to turn quickly to our poll here before I give Ken a chance to respond. Uh, looks like the majority of folks, 66%, uh, 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 almost two-thirds, um, have an accessible technology initiative in the organization where you all work. Uh, we can take that polling question down. I understand that there may be an issue with the polling questions blocking uh, um, captioning, so we, we don't want to keep doing that. So if, if, um, if we want to take that. Um, so Ken, uh, your turn here. What, uh, what what are you telling your friends and colleagues, and what would you add, perhaps building off of what Zuhair and Lucy have already told us? Okay, hi there. Okay, hi there. Well, there's two ways to look at this issue. One is internal, what Google does for its own employees, and the second way is what Google does uh, to include accessibility in its services. And I will address that second part first. Here, fortunately, I don't know how many of you are aware of Google's initiative or mission, mission statement to organize the world's information and making it accessible and useful. And see the word accessible is right there in the mission statement. And there you have it. And I would like also like to add, you know as they say about universal design, I agree with what you say about universal design. And I also want to throw in a little bit, a slightly different perspective. I've seen that in this area, we have, where you have high-tech startups. In theory, yes, the cost is less if you take the time to make a product accessible from the very beginning. But in reality, many of those startups don't have the time to do that. And they have to build a quick proof of concept, and they get just enough money to build the product, to get a little bit more money to staff up, and then go through, go through that iteration process again. And I see that pattern happening. Like it or not, that's what we see happening. And there are a lot of Google products, for example, that at first were not as accessible as they should have been, and then they completely turned around. In the past two years, there's been an enormous focus on making sure everything we have is, in fact, accessible. And that's wonderful. And Richard, did you want me to speak a little bit more about what happens inside Google as well? I do. I, I, I want to come to two of the back to two of the things you said there. I, I completely get and, and love the Google mission statement about um, organizing and making accessible the world's information. Um, you make this point about startups and how uh, they they sometimes don't have the time or money to do what um, what Lucy and Zuhair are, are recommending from the beginning. Um, I guess I'd ask, what is the implication of that, and it, are there things that Google is doing to to help um, you know, those new and emerging technologies to get over that hump? Do you mean for our own new services, or what we might do to help other companies that are not Google? Both. Okay, that's an interesting question. I can't speak for what 
we're doing for other companies, except for that many of our services are indeed free. And I would like to think that we set up ourselves as a role model in some ways. And I know that for my part in my service and YouTube captions, I believe we are a role model. And, and internally, I would say the main problem that I have noticed is that we're growing so quickly. And sometimes it's a challenge to make sure that every, everyone is fully aware and informed about the need for universal design and accessibility. But here we have quite a few people, I can't say how many exactly, but we do have quite a few people who are deaf or blind or have other disabilities. They are emerging in the workforce. They all help to make their colleagues and coworkers aware that we need to remember these things. So it's getting better here all the time. That's, uh, that's terrific. Um, and you, you raise a really interesting point there in terms of how quickly um, you know, Google is growing, but also uh, this field is growing so quickly. And this is such a dynamic field uh, when it comes to uh, 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 these kinds of technologies. Uh, I'm interested to know, particularly for, for our, our, our audience members here, how can they stay on top of all of the different trends? And, and I guess I would ask each of you, how do you stay on top of your own technological needs and, and preferences? And, and what advice might you have for our audience for how they can do likewise? Uh, Lucy, let me come back to you for that. How, how are you staying on top of this field and on top of your own technology needs and preferences? Sad to say, it's the, the standard answer that most people give today is social media is where I get my information in general. I participate in a lot of the industry listservs. I participate on Twitter quite actively. Um, I, I read several blogs that, I, that are people who I trust in the industry talking about what's going on, what's following. And then I attend conferences as much as I can uh, to, the, to the ability of the campus to, to let me go to, use the, to see these conferences and attend them. Um, it's really important to stay active and stay involved within the community. And since it is literally changing on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, if you're not participating in all these you know, new techniques of being socially active in the community, you actually fall behind very rapidly and very quickly. You know, in a day, the world can change. A product can become accessible overnight, and a product can also become inaccessible overnight, depending on the newest release. And by participating in the community, I can actually get that feedback as quickly as possible and work with developers and work with people and say, hey, all of a sudden you've got this new plugin, this new module that you've been using for a couple of weeks now that we've been having problems with. If you do this to it, you can actually have it work. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for that. Uh, Zahar, uh, you there at the Library of Congress, uh, both, I guess, you and Google are kind of in the business of organizing information. So how, uh, how do you stay on top of this field? Well, that's, a very good that's a very good question. I think uh, some people might actually argue that we have too much information these days, and that is probably true. We're overwhelmed with adverts, we're overwhelmed, we're overwhelmed with memos and communications and articles about all types of topics and, and news. And so the first uh, and most important part that I uh, use in my strategy is to figure out what it is that I want to stay on top of. Even when, so when we apply that to adaptive technology or to the field, the field is pretty large. And so, you know, you have mobile technologies, you have uh, 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 PC-based technologies, Mac-based technologies, other operating systems. And then you look at your role. Are you an HR person? Um, you know, are you uh, trying to uh, understand information from the legal side? or from the technical side. And so I think that's a very important key in determining what it, you know, how to get the information. 
in my case, it's, it's obviously I'm primarily technical. Um, I also deal with policy issues, so I, you know, those are the two areas that I focus on. But primarily, since we're in the business of technology assessment, um, social media is and has been a very, very good source. In addition to listservs, um, Twitter is actually becoming a uh, a, a very useful tool. Uh, where lots of information is changed almost instantly. Uh, a small example, yesterday, I think, or the day before, Apple came up with a, an update uh, to the iPhone, which broke some things. And it was amazing how quickly that news spread. And so, you know, we, we didn't have to update our iPhones and, and suffer any problems because we were able to learn about that sort of detail from uh, Twitter. Uh, but, you know, lots of vendors have Twitter feeds, uh, lots of vendors have Facebook uh, pages. Um, and again, you know, the, the, the nice thing about Twitter in particular is it is quite a bit more accessible because it gives you the flexibility of using a particular client that you like rather than having to use a website that is uh, forced on you. Lots, other, lots of other ways, obviously conferences, uh, podcasts are a growing um, means as well. You can listen to a podcast on your way to uh, work or somewhere, whether you're driving or whether you're on the metro, which is what I do. I'm not allowed to drive. Uh, and the other thing, too, is users. And you would be amazed at how much you learn from talking to other users who not only tell you what's going on and what is the latest happening in your field, but techniques and know-how and tips about using things you never thought really could help accessibility uh, to make things accessible. And, you know, we all know the, the magnifier, the standard magnifier that everybody uses to uh, make the text larger. But I'll tell you a little anecdote. There's apparently a, an item that people can buy called the luggage locator. And what that is is you put it in your luggage and you have a remote control. And when you get to your destination, wherever you're flying, as the bags start coming, um, you could start pressing the remote control and the system will beep once your bag is within range. And that product actually was never intended for blind people or, you know, for people who have visual impairments. That's just a general product that you could get off of Amazon. But obviously the um, application of that product to, uh, you know, somebody who's, who's uh, blind or vision impaired is, is quite useful. So lots of information there, but I think try to figure out what it is that you want to focus on and then social media, conferences, and communication, um, and networking with other users. That's terrific, Zuhair. Uh, could I ask you to be even a little bit more specific there? Are there particular uh, hashtags you would recommend people follow, or specific blogs, or listservs that you think people uh, should, should take a look at? Well, uh, uh, hashtag A11Y or hashtag A11Y on Twitter is always a useful one. And the tip I have is that hashtag and then you'll begin to notice other hashtags that deal with specific issues that you can follow. But I would say that the Twitter hashtag is the key. Uh, the the, the uh, number or hashtag 11AY, uh, A11Y, sorry, is, is the one to follow. Um, as far as podcasts, I would recommend, uh, I, I'm a, uh, an avid listener of the Theratech podcast. Um, Theratech in general as a company, even though they actually sell their own products, ha have done an amazing job exchanging information about all sorts of technology, including technologies that compete with theirs. And so I find their podcasts and their um, their uh, information quite useful. If you're looking for information on mobile technology, primarily Apple-based uh, products, then apps.com would be a website you want to check out. And again, many of these, many of the websites have Twitter feeds. So when you go to the website, you could sign up to the Twitter feed, to the uh, Twitter that they have. Um, with mailing lists, it's tricky because it depends on how much volume you want to handle. And um, so I, I actually don't use as much or don't subscribe as much to mailing lists as I used to, just because of the sheer volume of emails we generally get. But um, 
the, the one list I would recommend is the NFB um, promotion technology list. It's fairly quiet. Um, you get every few days you get announcements, and they're usually announcements that are on point that talk about new products or new things that you might want to hear about. And the list goes on, but those are the ones that come to mind now. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, and and uh, I, I would just uh, remind our panelists, please, if you are not speaking to, to put yourself on mute, we are studying some uh, some feedback. Uh, Ken, uh, your turn here. Uh, what? Uh, how are you staying on top of the field? And and what what uh, what social media, blogs, listservs, conferences, other things are you are you paying attention to these days? Okay. Okay. Well. I have to say first that I try not to use social media at all. <laughs> I'm so overwhelmed. That, like what Lucy said before, there's so much information out there. And there's really no way to try to track everything down. And my email inbox, has, I think there's about 10,000 messages that I haven't gotten to yet right now. So it's hard to get through the weeds and find the important things. But personally, I use... Um, we have, I have an excellent relationship with the National Association for the Deaf. And they have uh, a new website, a newsletter. Um, anytime something pops up that they think we should know about, they let us know. And also, for some of the technical advancements, we at Google are the ones doing it. <laughs> but you know, I even have a hard time tracking everything that Google is doing. But for example, uh, that I would like to give you. I worked with some people at Georgia Tech um, who are developing an Android, um, actually a Google Glass app. An application uh, to put captions on Google Glass, and so you know they're taking products that we already have and writing software um, that the you know so the Android phone could listen to somebody speak, have speech recognition, and send the captions to Google Glass. So you can see captions overlaid right at the person you're looking directly at. And there was a demonstration at the summer's NAD's conference. And that was very cool. A great example of what's happening when it comes to And I happened to know about it because I knew the people who were involved. As far as how other people who are not working here should keep up, I see. I can offer for for people who are interested in issues. There's the NAD. For folks uh, who are interested in blind issues, there are three great organizations to pick from. And there's other folks on the panel here who can speak more to that. Terrific. Um, thank you for for for, for your insights, uh, Ken. I also wonder there at Google, how do you um, keep your other staff and, and uh, colleagues up, up to date on, on the latest trends. Okay. There are several different ways that we can do that here. Every once in a while, we do have tech talks where we can tell everybody who comes what's going on. And we also have internal email lists that are kind of in general, you know, when in doubt, we can add more people and not less. And inside Google, we are very transparent internally. Um, there are other ways. If you're curious about something, you can go look at another team's source code and uh, get their information. And not always, but most of the time, that's available to everyone, anyone who works here. And there's a book that just came out. It's called How Google Works. And I would definitely recommend that if you want to understand how this stuff actually happened. And that's it. Terrific. Thank you, Ken. Lucy, how about you? There at, uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, how are you keeping your colleagues and peers uh, up to 
update on the latest ones? So we, we have internal lists. Uh, we have one system-wide and we have one at Berkeley specifically. I hold uh, bi-monthly meetings where people can come uh, either just to attend a, a peer review site, go through and see how somebody's site is working, learn from what that developer is doing, and uh, improve their own work by just watching other people's work. Um, I, again, I also tweet myself, so they follow. So several of my colleagues follow me, and uh, I try and retweet some of the better uh, A11Y tweets out there. And I hold seminars, trainings, um, various different activities for people to attend and interact with. It's we, we maintain a very nice website at Berkeley, uh, webaccess.berkeley.edu, that. Um, we put as much information as we can on there, and we link to some of the best information we're aware of out on the web. It's also a growing tool, so we're adding to it all the time. And we're always looking for new ways. We, we still think that we're not impacting nearly as many people as we would like to. So you know, it's, it's an uphill battle to maintain communication, but we're doing our best right now. Um, that's well. Thank you for those resources, and and I think uh, hopefully audience members, you're hearing a number of, uh, of of possible resources that you can continue to go back to. We'll we'll gather those here uh, and uh, uh, have them available for you so that you can also, if if you weren't writing fast enough there, uh, as 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 Ken and Lucy were sharing their um, their sources of information, we'll try to compile those for you as well so that you can have access to them. Uh, now, I, I kind of want to turn the conversation a little bit here and um, come back to you, Zuhair. You know, accessibility is an employer responsibility, uh, but people with disabilities know their own situations best. How do you think that uh, employers and employees can best balance these different responsibilities, and, and, and what are you guys doing there at, uh, at the library? This is the $64,000 question mm. because, you know, a lot of times you would hear uh, somebody saying, well, this system is not accessible um, and they are a user of assistive technology when um, what really is happening is that there are features of the screen readers that could be utilized to um, access that information. And so I think the first thing that we try to educate people about uh, particularly assistive technology users, but the general public, is the more training you get about that equipment, I think the better off you will be, regardless of what your role is. Um, we have in the past provided employees, particularly when we had new systems rolled out, we have provided training uh, on assistive technology, uh, again, in order to try to bridge the gap and make sure that the systems are, um, are usable. I think also I would always go back to training because when, for example, a company changes to a new system or when you have a new employee joining on board, and the, 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 the reaction is to try to send them to a training class that everybody goes to, and that may not always work because somebody who uses assistive technology may not approach the computer in the same way that somebody uses a mouse does. There are keyboard shortcuts that keyboard users need to know. There are screen reader shortcuts and techniques that screen reader users need to know. And so again, I think uh, the, the employer can understand these things and try to the best of their ability provide resources and provide the information in a manner that is uh, going to make it easier for somebody that uses assistive technology to access their information. Um, on, again, on the user's perspective, and I realize, you know, not everybody's going to be a technical whiz. Um, and, and, you know, there are people who are lawyers, there are people in human resources that have disabilities, and they don't really want to learn about the ins and outs and nuts and bolts of a computer. But I think that a basic understanding and comprehension of how your assistive technology works will help you do two things. It will help you better understand your needs, uh, because you know what the limitations that you're going to be running into are. And it'll, I think, uh, make uh, things a lot 
easier for you as you're exploring and, and as you're looking at, at, at your options. So, I mean, that's, and again, this is, I don't know that anybody has a magic answer for this question. This is sort of one of those equations that are still in the process of being balanced. And, uh, you know, sometimes it goes one way and sometimes it goes the other. But I, I think that the, the thing we can um, come out of, out of this is that I think both the employer and the potential employees have a responsibility of um, understanding what their needs are and uh, being able to communicate, define those needs, and work around them. So there's no magic answer uh, that you found, Zaheer. What about uh, you, Lucy? Have you found the magic answer for balancing employer and user uh, responsibilities here? I, I think primarily purchasing is going to be the key for that employer's responsibility. They've got to hold any vendor that they use feet to the fire when it comes to accessibility. If a vendor says, well, we know something's not accessible and there's nothing we can do about it, you can't be purchasing those products. And far too many corporations and industries are purchasing products knowing very well that they're not accessible. And, you know, there's, they come up with excuses, they come up with reasons for doing it, such as, well, it means our business need and we don't have anything else that will meet that business need. Well, maybe your business need itself needs to be readdressed. So that's on the employer side of the um, of the issue. But I would definitely agree on the, on the last point there is that the assistive technology user has a much bigger responsibility today than ever before. Assistive technology is hard to use. It's not simple. It's not easy. You know, it's, it's something that's very complex. It's very intricate, especially modern screen readers using modern web techniques and modern um, technology in general. It's complicated. You need to know how to use that technology. You need to recognize structures when you encounter them. You need to understand how to interact with them. Coming across a type of control that you don't recognize and say inaccessible doesn't cut it anymore. I, the developers are now starting to adopt what those of us in the web accessibility world have been pushing for a long, long time. But if the users don't know how to use it, it's meaningless. And I think you know, it, it may go back as far as K-12 education. K-12 education is not teaching people with disabilities as well as they are teaching people without disabilities to access computers. I mean, many of the students I see coming into, you know, Berkeley, one of the leading universities, have never used a screen reader to the utmost of its potential. They've used, um, to use a term in the right now, ghetto blindness products and not actually become active with mainstream products. Use the mainstream products. Don't use products that are specific to your disability only and learn how to use those products thoroughly and then learn how to recognize the structures and how those structures work that you can encounter on a daily basis. And demand training when you, have, when you uh, can't. Mm -hmm. Because if it is accessible in any way, you should be responsible for figuring out how to use it. If it's not, the employer is responsible for making it accessible or purchasing accessible products. So the employer needs to really um understand and zone in on their business requirements uh, and make sure that those are uh, taking accessibility into account. And then when they go to purchase products, you know, purchase products that uh, meet accessibility uh, standards and needs. Uh, but at the same time, the user needs to take responsibility for making sure that they know how to use the accessibility technologies that are out there and that, that, are, that are available to them. Richard, if I may, can I make a, a quick comment? Is that Lauren? Yeah, please. I was just about to turn to you, Lauren. Just let me uh, make sure I got uh, Lucy's uh, thought there correct. Did I did I recapture what she said there, Lucy, properly? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's a two-way street, and people have to work together. Yep. Lauren, uh, thanks for for uh, uh, for expressing your interest. We definitely want to hear from you on this topic as well, please. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Uh, that's definitely one of the things that that Pete is trying to, to help is to bridge bridge the gap between all of those audiences and really partner with all of them to sort of uh, piece together what uh, one of our contacts with Oracle Corporation called the Accessibility Puzzle, which Lucy did an outstanding job of, of um, illustrating that, that it's not just the technology, it's not just the um, the, the, the screen reader or the vehicle that, that sort of translates the web page or, or whatever the application might be to someone with a disability, but it's the creator of that product and it's the, uh, the, the end user as well. And uh, uh, she, she really put it very well in saying that, you know, everybody has, has a responsibility and there really is no easy answer. And, the, you know, that's why that, that training is going to become very important. Uh, and that's what Pete really hopes to do is to uh, sort of create that sort of public square analogy of uh, bringing people to the table and really exchanging, uh, you know, sort of pros and cons of, of various uh, solutions um, and also just illustrating uh, how things can be improved. And, and we hope to just open that up uh, to have a really nice, dialogue and to possibly influence uh, these technology providers uh, and and the end users to both meet in the middle. Mm. So thank you, Richard. Wonderful. No, no, thank you, Lauren. That's uh, That was great. Um, and, and, and speaking of trying to kind of hold that center and create that public square, I want to bring up a, a polling question here about um, accessibility champions. Uh, I would like to know uh, how many folks in the audience uh, have an accessibility champion uh, within their organization. Uh, the answers can be yes, no, I don't know, or not applicable. Um, and while we're waiting for those uh, responses to come in, I want to kind of keep going with this discussion about balancing different responsibilities. Um, and I'd like to know what uh, what advice you would recommend to our listeners, panelists, on how they can identify technologies, especially new and emerging ones that can help them be more uh, productive at work. Uh, and and um, Zahir, maybe I'll come to you first, if you don't mind. I think, actually, if you can. Sure. Um, so how do I identify technologies that could potentially be uh, useful to you at work? That is my understanding of the question. And. Uh, I think that, again, it depends on what your functional role, your approach might be a little different. But there are things that would be common. Um, again, I cannot, under, I cannot overemphasize the importance and usefulness of network, networking with people who have or use the same uh, assistive technology that you do and sort of have the same needs that you have. So if you're somebody who's totally blind, you have you use screen readers, networking with others um, that use the same technology is a great way to figure out um, how things might work for you, what new things might have come up uh, that would help you. And sometimes it's not actually a new technology that would make the difference to you. Sometimes, and I've seen it many, many times, it could be something as simple as somebody telling you a keystroke in Windows or in the operating system you use or in the screen reader that you use that makes all the difference to you. I, I recall uh, a similar uh, issue with we were around the table, myself and a bunch of colleagues, and we were all sharing our perspectives on collaboration and particularly how to deal with Microsoft Word documents that have comments in them. That's a, a, a tool that is used fairly often in organizations where you would send a report to your boss or to your colleague or to your direct report. And they would respond to you with the same document with the track changes turned on, and they would uh, add various comments in different places and make changes. And it was amazing when each of us shared the techniques that we use and the keystrokes that we know about uh, to accomplish this, how everybody went home richer and was able to actually do something they could not do before. And so I cannot overemphasize, again, networking. Um, and, and sometimes casual conversations, you might never know what, what uh, would come out of those. 
The other thing is look for regional conferences, regional mm -hmm. expositions, uh, uh, exhibitions rather, um, in your area that highlight assistive technology. Um, definitely attend webinars. Uh, those are an emerging great resource where lots of information is being shared. Um, and I think one key aspect of that is you have to also always be aware of what your needs are. And you know, that requires a little bit of consciousness and awareness of what it is that you're doing, what it is that's working well for you, and what it is that you're seeking help with or that you think you could do better. And that would help you uh, much better formulate a strategy for getting that information. But then again, there's always that part that you don't know that you don't know. And, um, and, and there's quite a bit of that. Sometimes there are new technologies that, that open up ways of doing things that it's sort of like the Radio Shack commercial. We have what you didn't think you need. And it turns out that you need it quite well afterwards. Uh, so again, that's, that's where um, finding the information, finding, uh, interacting with similar people that have similar needs or are in similar positions, and attending shows and, and interacting with vendors. Vendors are a great resource. Um, they obviously will all want to sell you something, and that's fine. It's, it's yes. what it is. But they also have a great, uh, they are a great resource in pitching to you. They, they, are, they have a vested interest in you knowing. So as long as you can filter the information and try to separate the sales pitch from the true um, functionality of a product, you could always at least get a head start by knowing what a vendor is working on or what a vendor has just come up with and seeing whether it would work for you or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Lucy, what about you? Uh, what advice can you give uh, on how, um, how, how uh, our listeners might identify the technologies, as the new and emerging ones? I, I first of all want to emphasize um, what was said there about networking and talking to people who know how to use it. So many people are isolated, so many disabled people are isolated from other people with disabilities and the similar disability. And that harms you more than anything else. Reach out to other people with disabilities, learn from them and experience from them and, you know, interact. I've been lucky my entire life to have a community of people around me with multiple different disabilities. And frankly, if I hadn't dealt with people with disabilities, I would never have gotten the job I have today. So it's really important to reach out and network with those people, but it's also important to network with people outside of the disabled community and interact interchangeably. People who do have a very, very strong community within their own disabled community tend to not even seek friends or seek engagements with people outside of that community. And that's critical, too, because, you know, sometimes a sighted person can help a blind person. Sometimes mm -hmm. a person in a wheelchair can help a blind person. Um, and sometimes a blind person can give a sighted person a piece of information that they needed as well. So, you know, expand your, your network, expand your community. I mean, being an extrovert is the best thing you can do for yourself even if it's counter to your, your personal um, preference. But it, it's really important to go out there and network with people and engage with them. But secondly, I have to say fear of technology or fear of change is the biggest thing that will hinder you in your life getting better with new technology. For many, many years, I resisted changing screen readers to uh, – one I knew was a better screen reader. I had tried it a couple of times. I knew that it, it achieved things that the screen reader I was using at the time wasn't able to achieve, and I resisted changing to it because it was different. I had to change the way I worked, and I had to you know, engage with it slightly differently and learn different terminology for the same activities. And you know, the older we get, the harder it is to change. It's, it's very... It is a very frightening, frightening thing to do. And you know, recently I just challenged myself and said, okay, I'm giving up using all the old technologies I was using. I'm no longer going to use Microsoft Office. I'm no longer going to use you know, a, a protected client made just for blind people using Twitter. And I went solely on the web, and then I changed my screen reader to the screen reader I knew worked more effectively. And you know, similar people, I mean, there was a bunch of us in the community doing this, and I think I was the only one who actually managed to make it through my last month 
and actually accomplish the entire thing, the goal I wanted to. And now I've switched permanently to using those newer technologies and using innovative new technologies. So, so we it, need to it, uh, challenge yourself. Challenge yeah. yourself and do not be afraid of change. So we got to get out there and network. We got to interact with people who uh, have direct experience with these uh, challenges and technologies, and uh, we need to be willing to experiment and, and take some take some risks uh, and change when when we need to. Um, I'm, I'm wondering also, we've got, so, since we're on this topic of identifying new and emerging technologies, we've gotten a, uh, a question from our audience here. Uh, folks would like to know, what are some of the other forms of assistive technology for those who cannot utilize audio and video communication cues? How can these be leveraged for such gifted um, talent who could benefit from these assistive technologies in remote global environments? Uh, any one of our panelists, uh, who, who would like to jump on that one? I'd be happy to take that, uh, Richard. This is Zahir from the Library of Congress. There are, indeed, plenty of assistive technologies. Um, so specifically, for example, um, things that don't necessarily involve audio output, um, there would be speech recognition. Uh, that is not a technology. A lot of people think that this is a technology that's helpful for the blind and vision impaired. And actually, that is not always the case. Um, it's helpful for people that have motor uh, disabilities. But other adaptive technologies, and we actually, funnily enough, this is probably the most we disperse at the Library of Congress, are adaptive uh, or ergonomic keyboards, uh, different types of um, keyboards and mice for people that have different challenges, so whether it's some, something, as, um, something such as carpal tunnel syndrome or something more complex, um, you know. And, and so there are uh, plenty of other technologies. But I think one of the things that, that this question reminds me of is I remember I was in a meeting uh, in a uh, project advisement. Um, and we were going through the 508 accessibility requirement and requirements, and somebody came up to me and said, you know what, most of these involve people who are blind. Are there any other technologies or requirements for people who are deaf? And it kind of got, or, you know, who have other disabilities, and it kind of got me thinking. Because I think not, uh, the, the biggest challenge to accessing technology is the fact that over the last 20 years, technology has been made visual. And so you're, you know, you're trying to deal with something that's created specifically to work with a sense that you do not have. And I think that's probably one of the things that presents us with the challenges. And that's why you see you know, probably a fair share of the requirements and assistive technologies that are out there are um, audio-based technologies. But you know, there are other technologies. Like I said, ergonomic keyboards. There's screen magnification. That's a very valuable tool that a lot of people use. Um, and there are, and keep in mind the definition of assistive technology is anything that would help you um, accomplish, uh, you know, what what it is that you're trying to accomplish, um, and and overcome a limitation. And so anything actually can be assistive technology. It doesn't actually have to be a screen reader or a screen magnification software. Mm -hmm. Uh, other panelists, uh, other ideas. And, um, yeah, please go ahead. I'll go Lucy and then uh, then Lauren. Uh, go ahead, Lucy. So, so I agree with that. I mean, I I always started when I worked with students assessing them. I said, you know, you can think of a technology, or you can think of everything being technology. A pencil is technology if you're using that pencil in a different, unique way that you've never thought of before. Many of my students would use a pencil to type if they couldn't actually gra they couldn't actually manipulate a keyboard. So that becomes assistive technology right off the bat. And you know, assistive technologies make their way into the mainstreams, and then they become more usable. I mean, we just think of the fact that speech synthesis is now used in cars. It's used in cell phones for people who are driving. It's, it's, it becomes a part of our culture, and we don't even realize that it started as an assistive technology. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really, a really important point that the, 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 these things can become mainstream and used by all, not just uh, by, by, 
by persons with disabilities. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we all use speech dictation now, even though we don't realize that we're using it. And that started as a form of assistive technology. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the thing to realize is that you have to look at what you're doing and you have to try and realize a way of doing it. Don't do it independently. That's, that's my key point is that, you know, reach out to somebody else who has the same situation and somebody who doesn't have the same situation and engage with them and work together with them. The important thing is, though, is if you have a disability and you want to become employable, you definitely need to make sure that you can present yourself as not having that disability, not necessarily not having a disability, but present yourself as that disability not blocking you. So, for example, if you have a speech impediment and you can't speak, use some form of augmentative communication. It's very difficult for a person who, who, who is actually a beautifully well-versed verbal person who has a speech impediment who then doesn't actually speak, they become hindered in their life. So find a form of speech, you know, augmentative communication and use it. Don't, don't let your disability block you. Get your assistive technology working for you and then you can become employable. And then you can become, you know, the full person that you actually are. Mm, that's a terrific point. Uh, Lauren, I know you want to get in here. Yeah, just, just really quick, and, and, and thank you both. That was, uh, I agree with those sentiments as well. Just just want to reiterate that, yeah, that is definitely Pete's uh, mission is, is around accessible technology or making technology accessible to the largest possible um, sort of uh, strata or group of people. And as, as was already uh, iterated is that different technologies and different scenarios or environments can simulate uh, disability. Uh, as, as Lucy was saying, if you're driving, you're not going to want to look at your, your screen. You need to watch the road. So, well, then you, you, you would have a visual disability when it came to actually looking at your screen. So maybe your phone talks to you. Um, if you're in a very loud room, you may not consider yourself with a hearing disability, but if you're in a loud room, you might have a hearing disability, and so you might need to have uh, something displayed on a screen, uh, you, know, uh, you know, something like that. Um, so, you know, when you can sort of see those synergies and where where they could go in the future, and, and just as what was stated is that, that, that technologies that sort of were in, quote unquote, the, these niche areas, you know, are now in the mainstream. Um, you know, audiobooks, I mean, have been around for, you know, decades, but, you know, some people might think, oh, this audible.com thing is this unique idea. It's like, no, not really. People uh, with visual and learning disabilities have been, you know, using audiobooks since, what, the, the 1930s, I think, or thereabouts. Um, uh, our, our our colleague at the Library of Congress could probably tell me exactly. But, uh, but yeah, just these, these different things. Um, you know, that's what I love to see is when when technology gets in the mainstream and when companies and organizations and people realize that, you know, no, this technology isn't created for this niche audience or this, this small subset of the population that um, when business and employers realize that, no, this technology that, that either I'm procuring or that I'm actually creating uh, can benefit everyone and can, can also benefit the uh, – bottom line of the business. Um, I remember at the M Enabling Summit uh, locally here in Arlington, Virginia in June, uh, Senator Tom Harkin said, you, you don't have to, uh, or, or, or you can do well and also do good. And, mm. and what he was alluding to is that you can do the right thing and you can also make a, a heck of a lot of money at it at, uh, in certain situations uh, as well. That's terrific. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, Lauren. I want to look at our, our, the results from our latest poll here. Uh, we asked the question, do you find that the administrative applications in HR systems at work, like timesheets, leave requests, benefits administration, travel, and, and et cetera, are accessible to you? And if you don't have a disability, has your organization made an effort to make these systems accessible? Uh, the majority here, 54.7% of our uh, of our of our, uh, sorry, of our audience said that, that answered that question, yes. Um, uh, and with the next largest group there being 20.4 at no, at I don't know, and 
about 16% uh, saying no. Uh, Lauren, is that, do you think that's representative, or what do you think about these poll results? I think it's really hard to, to say if it is or if it's not, just because we, we don't necessarily have a, a deep knowledge of our various audience members or kind of where they're working or what um, office equipment or, or software um, that they're using. But I think the fact that a, a lot are saying that things are accessible is a, is a good sign. Um, either that, as, as I think Lucy was saying, uh, people are learning uh, how to use these different tools with modern technology uh, and or that the creators of the technology are considering uh, accessibility standards like um, uh, uh, WCAG for uh, 2.0, for instance, or, or others. Um, but, you know, obviously uh, there's there's still a long way to go and it really depends on the systems that you're using and what what Pete is actually going to be delving into as our as our grant moves along is looking at the accessibility of various points of the what we call the employment life cycle. We're um, currently looking into uh, researching policy online job applications, how accessible they are because of course if someone can't even apply for a job then the rest of the cycle doesn't really matter. Uh, but, but very soon we're going to be trying to delve into the next step which would sort of be that um, accessibility of things like online or uh, excuse me, um, HR systems, uh, employee orientation systems, as was in the poll question, uh, time time sheets, uh, leave of ab absence type tools, type like HR technologies, uh, as well as uh, online or I'm um, sorry, uh, on the job uh, office equipment. We actually have. Uh, done a profile uh, of, of Canon USA. They're, they're one of our other Pete networkers, we like to call them. Uh, and they've done a very nice job at uh, really thinking about accessibility and accessible technology. And they've uh, interwoven that into uh, a lot of their office equipment. And what's interesting, uh, just to hark back to a previous topic really quickly, they even said in a previous webinar that we had that, that some of you uh, here may have heard that their accessible uh, um, web-based app for their office equipment, you know, also helped uh, the technicians troubleshoot because they could remotely log in to a, a client's machine and do diagnostics. And so that sort of was a synergy of making it accessible. But wow, this also applies to technicians. It, it applies, uh, people can remotely do something. They don't necessarily have to travel to the physical device. Um, so, it, you know, again, it's just sort of seeing those really, uh, uh, really interesting opportunities, uh, you know, where accessibility can really have much more of an impact. So we're seeing uh, accessibility having more of an impact in, in back office functions like HR systems and timesheets and benefits and travel and other things like that. We're also seeing, and you pointed out here, Lauren, in office equipment, um, there's also the rise of this, these so-called BYOD programs, bring your own device uh, to work. Uh, I'm interested in how our panelists are seeing kind of those kinds of uh, new trends impacting, uh, impacting accessibility in the, in the workforce. Uh, Ken, uh, it, how are you seeing this kind of uh, horizon of new accessible technology trends and, and things like BYOD sort of shaping the future? I'm actually going to take about a 90 degree turn if I may. Okay. Most of what we've been talking about so far has been, hasn't been focused on deafness at all. And that's what I am an expert in. So I would say some environments at Google um, are already accessible to begin with. Everything is online here. Everything, literally everything. We have no here. Most people don't even have a phone at their desk. Everything here is online. And it's a perfect environment for someone like me. And also, the device that you're talking about isn't necessarily hardware. It can be biological, for example. So a device that I'm using right now is called a sign language interpreter. And 
Google is extremely supportive of every deaf person who needs a sign language interpreter here has one when they need it, for as long as they need one. I know that's not and I know that it's not necessarily, you know, like the high-tech cool stuff, but it works, and it works really well. If you need, you know, they've interpret. I've, I've had interpreters at all of my previous jobs. Can't really I can't really comment so much on BYOD, bring your own device. Anyone here at Google is free to bring whatever they want. And if Google provides something, it takes the responsibility for to explain you know, what they need. If someone works here and they need something, they can talk to HR about it. And people here think, like, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that this applies to every company. And people like to do the right thing, but sometimes they don't know what the right thing is. If they don't know, they can't tell them. So there you go. Well, as a, as a user of accessible technology, and whether that technology is, as you say, Ken, biological or, uh, or hardware, what, what's, what's made the most difference for you? What's the most important thing that has helped you uh, in your job? Email. Online chat. Those two things. This stuff that really, the stuff that I helped develop, really. You know, before the internet even started. Yeah. So, on the other thing, I want to go back to something that Lucy said before. People who take responsibility not just for communicating what they need, but for learning new things as well. And it happens that, uh, you know, people become deaf later in life. And one of the technologies that are available is called CART. So basically, remote captioning. You, know, you send the audio to a remote location, and somebody there captions, just like we're doing today, right here, actually. And it's okay, but frankly, it's not as good as having a sign language interpreter who's right there and can see the exact expression and, and get the feel of the, of the communication. And for that, that person has to learn sign language. And that's what I did. I didn't know sign language until I was in college. And so, I don't know if that specifically answers your question, but that was my experience. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's great. Um, so we have I, to take, I'd, like yeah. to, I'd like to address this a little bit more, too. This is Lucy, sorry. Oh, please. Um, you can't let the, assist, the lack of the assistive technology block you from getting your work done. I've consulted with far too many people who get a new job and sit there and wait for the assistive technology to arrive, or I've seen people who have assistive technology, you know, refuse to bring it to work because it's the employer's responsibility to provide me with my assistive technology. Frankly, you got a job to do a job, and it takes time to purchase things. It takes time to do, to set up things and do evaluations. I actually use my own software at work, not because my employer doesn't purchase it for me. They have, but I'm not willing to go through the hoops and, and tricks and tr stuff I have to do to get it to work with the network. So I just use my own licensing and my own keys and get it done. My employer has bought those for me, yes, but you know, I was able to sit down at my desk and within 10 minutes have my software installed at the computer and start working and start engaging with people and being, doing my job, not necessarily you know, having to wait literally the three weeks for a purchase order to go through and then having a tech come out and install the software. It, it's critical to, to have their priority be get your job done and the assistive technology will take care of itself. Yes, the employer is responsible for making sure you can do your job and getting the technology you need, but ultimately you can't use that against them. You have to work with them and work together to make sure that you know everything is correct. I've had people who I've worked with, the Department of Rehabilitation bought them computer equipment and then they used to bring that into the office because this is what they bought for me for the office to use. And, and that's completely separate because actually the reason the Department of Rehabilitation bought that equipment was so they could do a job, not so that they had a computer at home, 
That's not the function of that agency. You know, if you have something, use it. Get past the rest of it later. Ken, I think you wanted to get in here. Uh, did you have something you wanted to say in response to what Lucy had to say? I sure did, thank you. I wanted to reinforce what Lucy just said about fear. And one thing I've seen is sometimes new people are afraid to ask for what they need. Because they're afraid that the employer will see them as the squeaky wheel, which gets replaced instead of oiled. And and again, having a network is very helpful. So you can know what to expect, know what's reasonable, and also, Oh, this, I was also just thinking this. I used to think, and remember, I'm deaf. I used to think as hearing people as as spiders. <laughs> Let me explain what I mean by that. One day I realized they were more afraid of me than I was of them. <laughs> I realized that I had to be the teacher in the situation. We all have to take that role of being a teacher to other people, other organizations. People who are new to this might not realize that, and that's really important, that we're all teachers, and we have to try to do the best we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, all, we are all teachers, and sometimes uh, <laughs> other people are more afraid. I think that's, I don't know if that's just true of, uh, of uh, people who are deaf and people who, are, who, are, who, who can hear. I think we often overestimate how, or probably underestimate how fearful others are of us, uh, wherever we are. Um, so that's, that's terrific. I, I want to make a turn here in our conversations. We're approaching the top of our uh, time together, and I want to kind of start to look at some of the more um, practical things that, that uh, employers and organizations can do to, to, take, uh, to take action. And, and to that end, I'd like to bring up our, our last polling question here. Um, about uh, the uh, role of accessibility champions in your organization. Uh, we'd love to know if you um, have an accessibility champion uh, in your organization, and you can respond yes, no, or, or I don't know. And, uh, you know, I think many of the, the folks in our audience are probably at various points of working with their employers on accessible technology. And I'd like to know from you experts uh, what advice you would give to them to help them encourage their employer to start an accessible technology initiative or, or further develop an existing one. Uh, and let me come, uh, Lauren, first to you, uh, representing Pete here, what, what, would you, what, what would you recommend? Uh, Richard, um, can you just repeat the first part of your question? I'm sorry. I got distracted sure. just for a second. <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> uh, I'm just asking, what, what advice would you give help folks in the audience to encourage their employer to start an accessible technology initiative or to further develop an existing one? Oh, uh, yes. I think really, as, as was already um, alluded to, be, be your own uh, self-advocate. Um, as the other panelists have said, know what you need, learn what you need, and then ask for it in, in, in a reasonable way, you know, as, as as Lucy was was saying, if if you already have something that works, you bring it to the office if you need to. You know, un, uh, you know, until those accommodations are uh, are met, if if that's what in fact it is. Um, I think employers uh, to to help uh, foster that that collaborate collaborative spirit. Um, Make yourself uh, friendly to uh, for people with disabilities. Uh, mention disability uh, on in your diversity statements, not three or four levels on your website, but but where it's visible, where it's very noticeable. Because talented, uh, qualified people with disabilities care about that stuff, and they will look for that. They will they will look at your track record. Uh, they will ask their friends uh, that that have experience with your organization. Perhaps uh, what is it like to to work there? Um, you know, social media has created a, a, a almost instant you know venue for that type of thing of of uh, learning sort of the good, bad, and the ugly, if you will, uh, on different organizations. So you know, make yourself uh, uh, you know friendly and open. Um, I remember years ago, I, I 
I got a job offer right out of college uh, from a consulting firm that I will we'll rename nameless. Um, and I, I got the offer. But w one of the first things they told me was, oh, you know, now we need to bring in our attorneys to uh, make sure that, that we do everything by the book and we get you what you need and everything. And, and I mean, that was fine. But the, the, the job I ultimately took with, with a, a very large software company, all they said was, you know, whatever you need, we, you know, we will get it for you. Now, I worked there many years, and, and I know they have uh, quite the legal department, and, and I'm sure they did the exact same thing, but it was, it was the culture. It was the way that, it, that the messaging was, was conveyed to me uh, that, really, that really made a difference. It was, it was really more like um, they, they hired on the ability of the person um, knowing what they're capable of and not sort of looking at sort of the opposite end of sort of that that um, uh, mirror, if you will. So uh, I think just uh, be open, be willing to to learn, um, promote your uh, pr promote disability as another dimension uh, of of your diversity uh, program. Uh, uh, Go to conferences, uh, you know, such as things like the Business Leadership Network conference and and others. Um, get the word out uh, about about your organization, and then just just learn. Um, visit uh, sites like our upcoming PeteWorks.org uh, to learn more. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just stop there because I know we are running out of time. I'll let the rest of our panelists weigh in. Uh, that's terrific. So what I heard there is that we need to be open. We need to be um, Focused on tone, be willing to network with each other, uh, and and have a willingness to learn, and that's really on both sides, both on the on the side of the employer as well as on the. Uh, Lucy, we've got only a few minutes. Just your top two or three recommendations. What advice would you give uh, to folks in our audience to encourage to help them encourage their employer to start an accessible technology initiative? Sorry about that. Um, I would give them the advice that you should try. And if you don't succeed, that's okay because use it as a learning experience and try again. Having people with disability not only increases your diversity, but it increases your experience and your knowledge base and makes you a rounder, fuller company. And it's really important to at least try. Don't think that something is impossible just because, you know, your building doesn't have a ramp to get in. Well maybe give that person the ability to work from home until you can accommodate that. There's always a way around if you want to think about it, but don't let a barrier or a roadblock be the reason you don't hire a person with a disability. And think of a diversity initiative as a way to teach your employees and have all your employees be the fullest people that they can be. They can all contribute more to your organization if they have the experience of interacting with not only people with this, but people from different cultures and people from around the world. Diversity is important because it, it makes us full rounder people. Beautiful. So we need to uh, be willing to try, try again, and stay focused on the business case of, uh, of unlocking the productivity of, uh, of everyone in our workforce and the, the real value of, that diversity brings in, in that. Uh, Zahir, really quickly, your number one recommendation, what advice would you give to help uh, our folks in the audience encourage their employers to start accessibility initiatives? I think that the most important thing is that the uh, awareness piece inside the organization, uh, as I said before, many organizations don't really think that they have that much of an obligation to people with disabilities because they just, they just don't have any or have very few employees. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the awareness piece is very important. Keep creating awareness in the organization, not only about the needs of people with disabilities, but also the contributions that people with disabilities that uh, can offer. And you know, the question always turn the question of can somebody do this or not into how can somebody do this. And you know, I think that will probably lead to a much uh, better way of of creating an accessibility initiative and coming up with real solutions that work. That's beautiful. Push the awareness and um, move into a, co a conversation of how versus if. Uh, Ken, last word goes to you. I need it really quickly. Number one uh, recommendation to folks in our audience. OK. There's no number one thing. Uh, the answer is all of the above. 
And uh, I completely agree, you know, to push the business case for diversity. We have to have a diversity. We haven't had a diversity department here at Google. And really raise, a, raise awareness and continue to challenge because it will never go away. Try everything that you can. And the last thing, Winston Churchill was famous for saying, never, 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 never give up. Ah, I love it. I love it. Never, never, never give up. Uh, that is a great note to end our conversation on. Unbelievably, we've reached that time when we're going to need to wrap up our webinar. This has been an incredible discussion. Users out there, you've heard a lot, and I hope you can take some things away from this and start using these ideas right away. And today, we had time to cover just a small part of this entire topic, so please stick with Pete, and we'll be helping you along the way. For those of you who'd like to view this webinar again or to tell your colleagues and friends about it, an archive version of this webcast will be available on PeteWorks.org in the very near future. Going forward, Pete is also going to have lots of great information and resources to help employers, developers, and users. You can follow Pete on Facebook and on Twitter for updates, so please stay tuned to Pete for information about more webinars coming up and the big launch in October. Thanks so much to our incredible panelists, Lauren, Zuhair, Lucy, Ken. You've been amazing, and we appreciate you taking time out of your valuable schedules to share your knowledge with our network. And finally, thanks to you and our audience for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, I remain Richard Crispine. Thanks so very much.